Being considered unlike others comes with many challenges. All too often, these differences lead to reactions that include intimidation, exclusion, and in many instances, physical harm. The most common reaction for the persecuted is retaliation, but not for Lucinda. While being persecuted for being gay, she chose to repay the animosity with nothing but compassion. Her remarkable story of paying it forward with kindness. This is how we cope. I'm Hugo Ribatika. Lucinda, you've met some rather unsavory people in your time, had incredible highs and lows. But at 12, you started a life of significance. Take us through your journey, please. Yeah, Hugo, I mean, it's an interesting life, and I think it's what makes it colorful. We start at that point. Um, certainly, 12 years old was, uh, for me, a very big high point. I had auditioned for The Sound of Music and uh, got to the stage, and for six months, that is what I did. I was in a production professionally in Cape Town, Nick and Milan Theatre. And it was six months of playing this little girl called Martha. And for me, at that age already, that was my zone. That was my happy place. That is where I came alive and I hit my flow. And um, it also was very nice being part of this family that for me, it was an illusion in many ways, but I made it my reality. I chose to live. How so? Was it an illusion? Well, they weren't really my family. But to me, they were more of a family than my own. So I enjoyed them, and I, I, I just made them my family. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a family, you know, six months on stage. And it was very nice not having to be myself for six months. So I was somebody else. And that, to me, was a, a, quite a relief for the life that I was leading up to that point. It was certainly, for me, a very different experience and a very special experience. It definitely gave me the edge going forward in my life because I got a huge amount of confidence and resilience at, uh, at being given that opportunity at such a young age. So who was Lucinda that wasn't Martha? Lucinda at that stage was very angry and very frustrated. Um, mm. You know, living through a very, very difficult childhood, um, extremely so. Martha was a free, free fun, loving, happy child. So I got to change places for those six months with, with, with the Martha rather than being the Lucinda. Now, at 15, you were in a relationship with a girl in school. Uh, is this your earliest memory of being gay? Yeah, I mean, I think it was innocent love. You know, it mm -hmm. was one of those things that people kind of, they, they brandish things so quickly. And I think nobody saw that actually it was quite pure and innocent. They made it tainted, but it was pure and innocent. Um, and certainly it had a profound effect on my own life and the goal at stake that, that I was supposed to be having a relationship with. Mm. You know, it's a classic old kind of innocent kind of thing. It's not tainted the way society makes it. It was two people really connecting and having a gel and having something special between them. And then the world, because of the indoctrinations and the fears and legislations, they get in the middle of it and they damage something actually quite beautiful. What was the reaction of the people around you? Maybe the students, the, the staff, the principal in the school? Or oh, ostracized, taken apart and find, you know, ridiculed. Um, made an absolute mockery of, treated less than a human being. Um, we, the relationship was halted. We were on constant, uh, constant watch. Um, we were not allowed to have any contact with each other. It was a very gruesome time. And, you know, everybody turns against you because they all believe that this is wrong. They've been told it's wrong, uh, you know, from the teachers to the school uh, scholars, to their parents, to whoever was involved you were treated really as if you were very close to, what words we use, trash. Uh, you, you definitely didn't deserve any sort of human um, rights. 
um, you were an outcast and you were labeled and you were boxed and that was kind of your the piece that you were delivered here. Yeah. Lucinda, you were 15 years old. How do you how do you even start to, to recover or live a life beyond this? At the time, I was named the bad person, which made it way worse. I was the one that was blamed, judged, criticized that I'd led somebody else astray. Mm. The girl at stake ended up having a nervous breakdown, ending up in a psychiatric hospital. From there, the drugs affected a kidney, ended up literally malfunctioning kidney, and her life was messed up for life. Wow. My life, I had to be the strong one. I had to get on with doing what I could. And I became very, very strategic. And it's probably why I'm so strategic today. Mm. As I learned at that time, there was only myself. I, there was no one else I could turn to. At that stage, you weren't, there was no one going to help you. There was no psychologist to help you. There was no one to turn to. So I had to keep all my pain and all I was going through within myself. And I had to find ways to deal with it in the best way I could because I was never going to be defeated. That's one thing I was determined never, ever to let them change me or um, ruin my life. I'm, I had that attitude from the beginning. So resilience was, was a factor then? Absolutely, yeah. And what else kept you motivated to go on? I started doing running, so I became a provincial runner. And running was a way of my big escape. Mm. Um, that adrenaline and endorphins that were let off for me was like my way of coping. And I kind, of, I kind of had to kind of lie a bit about my life in order to convince certain people. So I joined like a religious group in order to tell them, no, I'm actually, you know, I'm okay. I had to go and be baptized in a church in order to appease certain people in my life. And that's the way I survived, is, is feeding people the rubbish they wanted to know in order to survive. It, it really came down to survival. So this was all part of your strategy? It became part of my strategy. I had to survive. I wasn't going to survive unless I thought out the box and very strategically about the line I would take and how I would get through to the other side. And where was family during this time? Non-existent. It was not something that they were ever going to condone. Um, it was <clears throat> seen as unacceptable. So family was missing. Um, in many ways, how much they did or didn't know, I've, I don't have a recollection of that. All I know is the school made my life, if ever they could make it as difficult as they could, they marked me with a very, very black pen. Um, and, you know, th there was no support. There was, there was no kindness shown in any way during that time period. So you were literally on your own? Completely alone, yeah. With having to face the person that actually I did really care for, falling off the wagon quite badly and being blamed and shamed for that and having to carry that burden. Now that burden I carried probably till about five years ago. I still felt guilty and I felt the shame that I had uh, been the, the reason and, and, and I was like the curse to her life. Um, it, it, was, it was a really difficult process to get through is to find the forgiveness in my own heart mm for my part to play in, in that part of, of what happened back in my school days. So this was a period during school and post-school? Post-school I went to university and I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the game. I will just play the game because I wanna be under the radar. I wanted the heat off my tail. Um, I went to an Afrikaans university which had its own challenges being English. Um, Could you, do you speak Afrikaans? <coughs> I'm now bilingual, yes. Okay. Uh, but at that time, obviously, you're also ostracized for being English. So the discrimination story, it continued you know, right through. Um, and at that time, eventually, by my third year of university, I decided it's enough of this game. I'm going to change the dialogue. I'm going to live my life on my terms. And that's where the, the game changer game so came So was along. there an actual moment? Was it a, a phase, a period? What was the trigger that said, you know what, this is the time that you make that change? Yeah, you know, I think it was two and a half years of really playing the game. And I could feel that I was tight as a spring inside, you know. You can suppress your, re your own truth for so long. Um, and I met a couple of people, you know. I was, I was studying physical education, mm. you know. The typical BA 
uh, wormclum, like they call it in Afrikaans, which is, you know, it's, 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 it, that's the field. So I was exposed to some people that, you know, were gay. And, and I think by my, it, it was probably about that June that I decided, no, hell this, am I playing any more of the game? You know, appeasing, kind of keeping the peace, not rocking the boat, kind of doing what others. I saw kind of, I think I saw the end of my degree coming and I thought, let's run. So I decided to, to, take, to take foot and to live my final six months of university on my terms and, and live the life I wanted to. And that's where I started turning that around. So what was the difference in how you lived your life post this period and, and before? Yeah, I mean, it changed, you know. Um, if, I look, if I look at university, it was more about being rebellious. You know, it was more about, you know, I'll do what I want. Um, I will, you know, it, it, it had a very different spin. At school, it was very pure and very beautiful. It was, it, was a, it was a gentle, natural process. By university, it was almost like, I'm going to show the world what I really think of them. So I'd now have a lot of attitude added to it and kind of, I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm really going to make, make this tough for, for you. Know, so it, it was very different um, how, how I lived those months um, after, yeah, after deciding I'd had enough of the game that I had to play. And we talked about you being very determined. Now, one of the things that uh, illustrates your determination is rowing, canoeing rather, and you making it for the Olympic team, is it, in uh, 1996? 96 Atlanta, yeah. So, you know, by that time, I'm, I was muscle-bound, can't see it really now. <laughs> but, I, you know, um, age, age just you know, changes the musculature a little bit. Um, I was always, you know, way shorter than, than you should have been for a, for a top canoeist. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, my, my double partner, myself, we came third in men's essays, which is unbelievable. You know, to come third amongst the South African men's uh, for 30 kilometers is, is such a mean feat. Uh, the problem is her husband had gone across to Atlanta. I didn't have a way to get across. And she actually came third in the singles. Wow. She actually came third in the Olympics. And that's testament to uh, the hard training we were doing, um, the, the caliber of, of, of a canoeist that she, she was as well. So that was, that was, you know, a big moment for me as well, is uh, my time, obviously, as a canoeist, uh, paddling for what was then the Transvaal. Um, and, and yeah, it, that, that showed my total gut determination, even in the sprinting, where I pipped a very, very good canoeist in, 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 in Rudderplatt Dam. You know, it, it, it definitely, each time, it came up to that performance, that they're being able to get up there and show the edge. Um, it's, it's what really paid off. Lucinda Harmon, determined fighter, faced a lot of persecution, but paid it all with kindness. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. We're speaking to Lucinda Harmon, who talks about her life of persecution as a gay woman. But we're delighted that all of this has come out with you being very, very successful at many things. But let's go back to your time in which you found refuge in, in people of, of colour. Yeah, I think from a very young age, um, I did not buy into the conditioning and indoctrination. I, I could see it for what it was. I could see the lie. I could see people were living a lie. I didn't like the sheep mentality. And I don't know how and I don't know why, but I chose to really look outside of the box that I was firmly entrenched in. And I think a lot of it was because I didn't have the happiest family life. So what I did is, you know, in those days, Transkai laborers were coming in and out um, in Cape Town. Mm. Now, I made friends with them. I used to make them rock buns. I learned how to make nkumbuti. There was things I learned because of them. And I then also in my school, instead of being with, with my friends, supposed friends at break time, I went and looked for the people of color who were sitting at the back quarters somewhere. And that time gave me a lot of gentleness and it gave me way more than I was getting um, outside of that. So being discriminated against, did you feel that you and them were in the same boat? I think, I, I think you know, Hugo, I think you, you've probably hit that bang on center. 
I think I always felt like an outcast and I felt rejected by society and discriminated against, heavily judged. And so I did relate. I did relate to probably their plight as much as what I felt. Mm. It was interesting, we never discussed that though. We just had a common respect and it was a gentle, beautiful time that I had with each of those people in my life. And that is what's actually rounded me to who I am today. It's given me that diversity that most people yearn for. It's something that really is just inherent and part of me now. So how did all of that make you feel? Because you were, you were obviously a, a beautiful soul. You're a good person. You just chose to live your life differently. Yeah, I mean, I think inherently we're all good. It's something that uh, I certainly found out in a, I don't think we may cover it in this, but it will be coming up in my TEDx coming up is uh, I, I learned about the fact that inherently there is good. We just gotta believe in the good in the next person. And I chose at all times to find a way to deal with things and to find that which did soothe my heart. People that did see my good, um, people that did believe in me, uh, people that I could connect with. So even though it was disconnect the rest of my life, I found the connect where I could. Now, you spent three years in, in Soweto, so not the typical scenario, white woman in Soweto, which is predominantly a black community. Yeah, I got a contract with Bell's Whiskey. I created my own agency at the time because I realized that they were in a dash of trouble. Here was a, a white male fly fishing golf brand, and if they didn't make a change, things were not going to end well for that brand. And I came up with a strategy to move it to then the emerging middle class, which would have fallen under the colored black community. Mm. Started that in Cape Town, and then I moved it across to Gauteng and worked it with the radio stations. It was a, a show that I did for three years. Um, it was, a, it was a, a well, well respected show, but the fact it lasted was the longest ever radio show to, to last. It was called Bell's Rhythm of Golf. You can see I changed the entire identity mm. I really prided myself in the fact of really getting the golfing, the face of golf changed at the same time because I now was inspiring black golfers to play the game and showing the positives in corporate and about getting into the game as well as a lot of education on whiskey at that time. What I found at that time is I was actually writing a book which is still unfinished at the time and I chose to be more time than I needed to be in Soweto and the question is, why did I do that? It's because I felt at home. I actually really felt more at home in Soweto probably than most places in my life. Because can, you I always, can you tell us why? I think I've always had a sense of feeling that I don't belong. Mm. I've never felt I belong to anything or any particular group or any you know, place. And Soweto was, for me, such a gentle stop. And I mean, I was in the Shabins, I was in the taverns, I was sitting at night you know, as you said, yeah, I'm a white woman sitting with, and even we, you know, friends outside saying, you're like, you're becoming more and more black. I mean, we can't relate to you anymore. Um, what's happening here? We're feeling uncomfortable. A lot of people walked out my life because of it. And I was just living my life. I was enjoying my life and I was living my life like I was a Sowetan. And I never got enough of that. Uh, it was a Pimville golf course was a place that just always touched my soul. Um, you know, they had minimal access to help to make the course look great. Mm. Uh, but I really had such a deep appreciation for the people that came into my life at the time. And I, I was working with a lot of uh, the IFP, the ANC. There were a lot of people I was engaging with, polit political well-known figures at that time. And it, that was a time that was really for me one of the most soulful times of my life. Um, that is where I've pulled a lot of my life going ahead it comes from those three years of my life. So it's fair to say that you weren't judged? I wasn't judged once. And people would have thought I would have been. I think many times I'd be somewhere and they'd be talking about, you know, you know white people, this, that, that, and then they look in the room and, they'd, and I'd, I'd be sitting there going, and then I'd smile and they say, like, we don't even see that anymore in you. You know, it, 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 it was a whole time for, for healing for so many people at that mm -hmm. time. 
And I think we realized that we transformed any of that. It, it, it was no longer um, a racial color. We, we weren't there. How, how do you think you achieved, how you achieved that? How did you break down those barriers, Jacinda? By really spending time with people and hearing their stories and connecting with them. Opening your heart, opening your life to that person and understanding there's one key thing we share is our humanness. Mm. And if I choose to see your good and I connect to you, nothing holds us back. There are no divisions. There'll be no segregation if we can get to that point between people. Two things I'd like us to look at. One, uh, the greatest highlight uh, that you've enjoyed in those 52 years, and potentially your lowest moment, or where do you feel that you faced the biggest uh, amount of persecution, if you will? Let's start with the not so favorable one, then we'll mm. finish on a better one to make us all feel <laughs> a little bit more cheery. My bottom line was living in Bloemfontein, I'd lost everything, I couldn't get work, and I went down. I lost my home, I lost my car. I got to the point where I had to ride a bicycle. I had to literally beg people for money, for electricity, for food. Wow. That was, as a high achiever, that was a really down time, and it became a time of desperation where I lost all my faith and hope in life. I, every morning, woke up just wishing I'd died. And wow. it, it, it came down to one morning waking up and deciding, you know what? You and only you can change this dialogue. If you want to live, you better get up and you better fight again. And that is how I came back. If I look at my highest point in life, I think it would have had to be the bucket list number one. They've been sitting there for over mm. five years called TEDx. And the day I actually got the invitation to present my TEDx speech, I think has got to be one of those highlights of life. There certainly have been quite a few, um, but that, that one right now is probably, you know, most, most most prominent. Interesting you say that, but you've, one of the things that you've done uh, significantly is you've repaid much of that animosity with kindness. Uh, what brought this about? What are those activities of kindness that you've shown uh, this community and people in general? I think it really started my time in the Free State where I faced, I faced really serious discrimination and judgment. It was probably one of the most difficult time periods of my life where I did not belong at all. There was no sense um, in, at, 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 at all that, that I was in the right place. And I always ask myself, why are you here? You know, what are you doing here? What is the lesson? And I kept on trying to get the lesson because I was always trying to leave. I didn't want to be there. Mm. And I faced quite a few negative situations. Uh, the property around where I was living was burnt down three times. I got a threat as well against my life at that time as well because people didn't appreciate the, the, the grand difference that I was. It was uncomfortable. And instead of, they could not accept that. And what happened is, at that time, I sat with a, I sat with a problem and I realized that, what, what can I do? I can't get out of here, mm. so what am I going to do about it? And I turned to people in the community, one by one, and befriended them. So that they could start to get essence of who I really was. You dug into that strategy again. I dug <laughs> in that strategy again. And slowly they started warming to me. And then the community realized I wasn't such a risk and I wasn't so dangerous and I wasn't to be feared. Why would you be a risk or would you be dangerous? They felt by being gay in their community, as it was seen at that time, was I infectious and I was contagious for whatever reason. This might not make sense to anyone watching this, but that was their dialogue going on. Um, so a fair amount of ignorance, you'd say. Indoctrination, conditioning. This is what was kind of felt and, and believed. So from, from that, I had to show people that this person that you see is so bad or negative, actually is actually at a core level, mm. actually a kind human being. I'm human. 
I'm not an animal, I'm human. And then from there I started a project uh, which was abandoned Bloom Art. And I decided I was doing random acts of kindness. I was going to the petrol stations and I was doing songs which I've got clips of on my YouTube. I was doing a lot of work around doing upliftment work putting smileys wherever I went, giving it out in shopping centers, wherever I was going. And then someone joined me and we started doing Abandoned Art. And in that, which ETV News eventually broadcast, is the fact that these rocks or a book I would leave with a message after I'd finished reading it. This got back, obviously, to the ETV crew. And they were fascinated by what I'd done. And I, what I was trying to show them is the fact that I chose to pay forward kindness mm. and goodwill. And I wasn't going to partake in the pain, abuse, anger cycles that were around me. I was going to show people there was a different way. And I was not going to give anger, hate, judgment for anger, hate, and judgment. I was going to pay back at all times and show people another way. How are they going to deal with it? Um, let's do this differently. And... Yeah, the project certainly had a ripple effect into the community. So final words, your words to Lucinda at 19 and potentially to a 19-year-old out there who's going through similar persecution. I think you've got to be truthful to yourself. Number one, don't lie to yourself about who you are. If you can find someone that you can confide in, if you can find that person, really find a mentor or someone in life that can guide you through if you really know you can trust them. I hope in 2020 that's true. It wasn't like that years ago. I'd also say, don't get angry. Don't meet a, the anger and aggression with more of that. You're not going to come out on top. The way to go about it is to always just be as kind as you can and not get into that aggressive, throw things down your throat, um, the radical approach like an activist like I was in my early years. I learned to be way more approachable and kind. And uh, yeah, if you're 19 and, and you're going through that, I hope your family supports you. And if they don't, you need to find a surrogate family. You need to find your people. And your people are going to support you and look after you and encourage you on your journey. Lucinda, thank you so much for speaking to us on COPE. Thank you, Hugo. We've been speaking to Lucinda Holland, And as she says, be kind. This has been COPE. Remember, together we can. Goodbye.